Good morning, Karen. How are you going? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah, well, you're over in uh, British Columbia in uh, in Canada. I'm yes. over here in Brisbane. So uh, yeah, great to chat. Um, yes. I've I've really loved your work recently. You um, were in our data driven fasting challenge and contacted me to go on your podcast, which we just did, which is a lot of fun. So yeah. uh, I don't know what I'll do after this. I just want to keep on chatting to Karen. It's been a, a whole ton. <laughs> Of fun, but um, you've dove down the the rabbit hole of um, uh, female hormones and understanding hormones and what we can do with um, diet and lifestyle and uh, and other things as well. So yeah, it's amazing how many people in the data driven fasting community that just seems to be the the demographic that is interested in fasting. That are the the middle age. Um, menopausal peri perimenopausal postmenopausal um, women yeah. who come to fasting and, and then you know have issues with fasting due to hormones and just trying to manage that to, to do it as well as they can so um yeah really excited to have you on because um I've, I've got a wife that uh, i love to watch her insulin and blood sugars and see how that changes through the uh through the months and understanding that which i've nerded out a bit too much on trying to understand how much insulin varies across the month but uh, <laughs> beyond that i'm not a guru um in that area so it's really exciting to, to come and have you chat about all that stuff oh i'm super excited to be here because going through all your being so immersed in your stuff for the last month <laughs> of course i keep like oh but i could talk about the hormones with this oh but he's <laughs> missing what about the hormones when it comes to what the hormones so how did you dive into the, the, the hormonal rabbit hole, which yeah, I imagine is even oh. more convoluted than nutrition and <laughs> uh, and fasting? Yes, it was. It pulled me in because I had my, of course, my own massive issues. I felt like my whole life with hormones and nobody told me that it was hormones. Mm. And mine all started when I was pregnant after I was pregnant with my daughter, my first daughter, I was 31 when I had her. And by the time I was 33, I was rapidly gaining weight, you know, and I was this, you know, always been a health nut. Yep. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to do what I'm being told to do. And so I went on to the next best diet and trying to lose this weight. And I had suddenly severe insomnia. My gut problems were just brutal. I was like, looked like I was three months pregnant by the end of the day. And I was doing, you know, I was eating the whole grains, slow fat, you know, trying to and eat you're well. you a nutritionist by training, is that right? <laughs> yes, I am a nutritionist. Not at that time, but okay. um, at that time I was doing body work. And um, you, you guys, you probably have never heard of it. It's called rolfing. Do you guys have rolfers in oh, Australia? I'm not sure. Not there sure. was a school they, for they, it there when I was going to school. So, but it's not, it's, it's a very niched out type of yeah. body work. But anyway, so I was doing that. So I was in the health field and trying to figure out why am I not losing weight? Like I'm not mm. eating bags of cookies and going to fast mm. food. And I started working out harder than I'd ever worked out before. I was doing this like kind of CrossFit style workout mm. five days a week. Wow. I hired a personal trainer prior to that, thinking that was the answer. And I'm working out with all these other women my age. Mm. And they've got these like solid, you know, rock hard abs <laughs> and they're just shredded. And I'm like, I'm just getting I'm fatter. <laughs> I'm yeah. just getting fatter and fatter. And I was the fattest I'd ever been. And I'm like, what is happening? And I just went and I just kept moving from diet to diet thinking that was the answer. And finally, because so much of it had to do around my hormones, like I was getting severe premenstrual migraines. Um, I was getting was really depressed, you know, around that time. My doctor put me on an antidepressant, the insomnia, like all of these other things that kept telling me something hormonally is wrong here. What's going on? But I'm 33, like no doctor at that time is going to be like- Pretty early to have the issues. Right? Like yeah. nobody's going to say, oh, maybe you're, you've got some hormone dysfunction. So on my own, because I was getting so frustrated, 
I went down that rabbit hole of, okay, maybe it's the hormones. And I started to research that and there wasn't hardly any information about it from, for my age. Mm. So I went to my naturopath and said, could you test my hormones? And he's like, yeah, I'll test your hormones. And sure enough, they were just a complete mess. I had no progesterone. My cortisol was tanked. My DHEA was tanked. My estrogen was too high in comparison to the progesterone. And so here I was doing all the wrong things for that hormonal profile. So I was in a caloric deficit. I was working out so, so hard, running, doing the CrossFit. Like it was brutal. And then mm. plus, you know, practically starving myself, mm. which was the exact wrong thing. Now I know, but that's the, was, that that's the exact wrong thing to do when you have no cortisol and you've got no DHEA, which means that I was in, like my adrenals were tanked. And so I was just, my body was like, no way. We're just going to hold on to this fat as hard as we possibly can yeah. because she's a complete wreck. I was a single mom running my own business. Like no wonder. But at that mm. time I never thought, oh, I'm mm. stressed out. No, mm. pff, I didn't even consider that. So I shifted everything. I was like, okay, that had this, I got to completely change what I'm doing. And around that time, that same, when I went to get my hormone results for my naturopath, I said, what diet should I do? Mm. this is back so this is over 10 this is 12 years ago my naturopath said i just went to an anti-aging conference and learned about something called the ketogenic diet wow <laughs> i know that was a long time and ago so long no one had heard of it back then not here anyways yep so I went home, I started to research it. And what came up was actually primal blueprint with Mark Sisson, oh, the, wow. uh, Mark Sealy Apple. And so I went out, I bought his book, the 21 day primal blueprint. I just started it. I felt like, Oh, like the angels came down. They were singing to, I was like, Oh my God, this <laughs> is it. This is the diet I have been looking for because my stomach problems went away. My inflammation wow. went away. My blood sugar stabilized. I was the person that, would not leave home without a snack in my purse. Like God forbid I didn't have a snack in the car because my blood sugar would crash constantly. I couldn't go more than two hours without eating. And so I find paleo and it's like this beautiful thing. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. One month in really and I, I love yes, it. completely. <laughs> but Marty, I didn't lose a single pound, Oh wow! <laughs> but I knew that that was the diet. Yeah. And so then I knew that I was eating right. And then I addressed the hormones and it took a while, but eventually the weight started to come off. And I went to doing nothing but yoga, you know, fixing the adrenal system. I took a little bit of bioidentical progesterone, started taking some supplements. It took some time, but eventually that weight started to come off. And later down the road, you know, I found out I was hypothyroid and my reverse T3 was wonky and all these other things. But that set me on this journey because I realized how many women out there are doing mm. everything right mm. and they're not losing weight. And yeah. you hear this all the time and you're, you know, not all the time, yeah. but you do hear it in your group. I hear it all the time myself where people come to me and they're like, I have been, I've been following keto for 12 months and I haven't lost a single pound. Mm. I've been doing fasting. I've been doing vegan, whatever the diet is, carnivore women that go down to 800 calories a day or mm. one meal a day and they're still not losing weight and they're being told to just do it harder. It's definitely something going on beyond just the how yes. much and what you eat for a lot of women at that point. So why has it changed? What's changed in our environment that hormones are becoming a, a bigger deal? I mean, is it just the food or what else has, has moved it's the needle? we've created a perfect storm unfortunately like there's we tend so to do that many, oh we really do <laughs> we're very good at optimizing <laughs> our environment to uh, yeah yeah i say you know i think one of the first thing that's that's happened is we as women have kind of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit mm -hmm. by demanding equality which is i'm all for it i'm a yeah. feminist but with that has come like now it. you know two parents that are working full time and raising their children, which raising children, as anyone knows, is a job in and of itself, a full time yeah. job. Yep. You know, and we're so we're we're suddenly piling on all of this stuff, all this stress on ourselves, where we're women are told to do hardcore cardio at all times. 
you know, and to barely eat calorie count, mm. watch the children, cook clean, and hold down a, you know, make as much money as your husband is making, if not more, right? Like, yeah. go for it. Come on, woman. And it's like, <laughs> What's that going to do to our body on the inside? We are so much more fragile than the man. Like you guys, with the way your hormones work, you think very like simplistic in your brain in most cases. Like you don't get simple. Cool. Yeah, you're simple minded. <laughs> <laughs> no. I like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah. But you're, you don't react to stress. Yeah. Your hormonal system doesn't react to stress the same way that women do. So we have this perfect storm of that happening as well as the endocrine disruptors that are in the environment. And this mm. is really impacting men as much as women, I think, mm. too. Um, women, we just see it more because we're the ones that are trying to get pregnant and carry a child, right? So we, with this growing epidemic of infertility, we're just hearing more about it on the female side. But men are getting affected by it, for sure. But we have so much estrogen mimicking chemicals in our food, in our environment. And then not only that, not even just the estrogen mimickers, we're also just bombarded by toxicity, even mm. just with the amount of light, artificial lighting 24 seven, you know, mm, mm, you know, mm. we're staring at our screens We're we're women are, you know, it's so cool for women to drink right now. It's like mm. everywhere. You can't watch a Netflix series without women just downing their scotch after in every single episode. And so we can daytime having, drink now because you don't have to oh, waste time. So. Absolutely. Day drinking. <laughs> Lockdown, day drinking. Lockdown. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I love that point that um, you know feminism has brought. You know how much child rearing does the man do post -fem feminism? But they've still now they've got a, a full time day job added to the the home and child rearing duties, and it's it's not really equality. It's just doubling the workload in a lot of ways. Yeah. So that, that's a really important point, I think. I think it is too. I think it's very sad because I feel like. We have to regress a little bit to progress right now. And mm. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it looks like, like I think women should have, you know, at least four years maternity leave. I think that would be a great wow. start, you know, and that could be shared with the husband. So, you know, mm. you each take, you go on and off year, year for you, year for me, where you take off mm. time to raise your children. So other mm. people aren't raising them for you. Yeah. You know, the cost, the cost of living, all of these things make it so that it's so challenging for a family to go on one income. I know mm. people that have done it and it's, and I can tell that they are struggling. And even mm. though their partner makes good money, mm. they're struggling. Mm. Yeah. And it's just, it's not right. What we've done isn't right. We have to find balance in that somewhere, you know, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, challenging topic for another, another chat, but yes. um, so what is hormonal weight loss resistance that you talk about a lot and you know how much are hormones affected by weight and vice versa obviously you know being overweight will mess up your hormones to some degree but yes. you know, how much does the how much is hormones the chicken versus the egg yeah that's a good question i think it's a little of, of both equally yeah. but when I say hormonal resistance, I mean, weight loss resistance, I really mean it, this could be from a number of different hormonal imbalances. How you can identify it is exactly my journey, which was mm -hmm. you're trying to lose weight. You're, you really truly are eating well. Like, I mean, I'll have women come to me and be like, I just can't lose a pound, you know, but I do, you know, Karen, I do eat a couple squares of chocolate, at, you know, mm. every couple of days. And they think that this <laughs> is what's chocolate. causing their problem. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God, or, or I don't work out enough, even though they're working out, you know, an hour a day doing a hit class or whatever it might be. Mm. Mm. If you're doing this right, if you're eating right and you're doing these things and you're not losing weight, or maybe you lose a little bit when you jump onto the next best diet, you might mm. lose a few pounds in the beginning. And then it just comes to that screeching halt. Mm. Um, in the keto world, Marty, we'll see it usually three, three months plus where people will, they get this great weight loss in the beginning. They, they reverse a lot of chronic problems. And then it seems like as time goes on and the longer they do it, the more hormonal stuff comes up and they can't say, mm. oh, it's the hormones, but they'll, they'll say, I stopped losing weight. Oh, mm. I can't sleep. 
Yeah, I've got terrible mm. insomnia. Mm. Oh, I've got hot flashes. I can't tell you how many women have come to me for coming from the carnivore OMAD keto world that have said, I lost my period. Yeah. And they keep doing it. I had a girl <laughs> recently and she was like, I haven't had a period for a year and a half. And I said, oh, well, what, what, what have you been doing? But I did, I was keto for a couple of years and then I went carnivore. And I said, okay, well, did you stop? No. I'm like, oh my God. Like your fertility is a marker of your health Massive. for women. Mm. Right, mm. or if we're here to procreate. Whether or not you do, that's your own choice. But really, on the inside, your body is here to procreate. That is it, and that's what drives everything. If you don't have enough energy or health, your body just shuts down and says, "Not now. We're going to wait till we've got enough food and we're healthy enough to procreate in the future." Because we can't do it now. So yeah, it's very yeah, important. and that happens at different times for different women, right? Like the heavier mm. you are, the longer you can go on those extreme diets. Mm -hmm. You know, but eventually it's going to catch up to you and your body is going to say, well, geez, you've been eating 800 calories a day for the last six months. And yeah, you've lost 60 pounds, but we're going to shut down your fertility because there's obviously not a lot of food around. And that's mm. what happens. Yeah. So more about the, the diet extremes. What are the challenges that you see with extreme carnivore, extreme keto, low carb fasting? What, what? Do those things do to your hormones potentially and why so when you're when you eat a ketogenic or you're eating you know the one meal a day carnivore style diets you you go into a caloric deficit because it's mm. very hard as you know you preach mm. this as i do too you can't overeat meat it's very hard to do yeah Right, so you're on a carnivore, carnivore is diet. Carnivore great because you're just going to get enough protein unless you're adding infinite lard to that because you believe that protein's bad as well as eating a carnivore, which is pretty weird. But yeah, yes, yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> but so if you're eating nothing but meat, so now you're in a caloric deficit. Now you've got no carbohydrates coming in, and I know that it's not a, a macro that is needed for survival, mm -hmm. but it does have a role mm. in our hormone system, mm. right? Mm. Your, your thyroid, for instance, really likes carbohydrates. Mm. Your adrenal system really likes mm. carbohydrates. So what we'll see, what I see happening is the insomnia thing, for instance, it's because their cortisol and their adrenaline just start pouring out because mm. they're just in this state of almost starvation. So their stress markers go up. They can't mm. sleep at nighttime and they're going, well, what, what's wrong? And as soon as you say, go put some, just eat, eat a sweet potato with your dinner. Boom. They're sleeping. And they'll yeah. say that to me. They'll be like, but, oh, but you the know carbs what? before so big can really make a big deal in terms of, you know, lowering the cortisol and enabling you to sleep a bit better. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So fasting raises cortisol mm. and cortisol is like this big, I always say he's like the bouncer at the front of a bar. He's like the big steroid guy. That's not going to let anybody in. Cause if yeah. your cortisol is pouring out, you're telling your body that there's a threat. Mm. It doesn't know you're in 2021 and there is no lion chasing you or whatever <laughs> it is. It just thinks it's you're, just you're in a famine because you're not eating very much. You're not eating any carbs, so it's not summertime. It must be wintertime. And actually, wintertime in hunter-gatherers, mm -hmm. their hormonal system changed so that they didn't mm -hmm. get pregnant. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. I mean, of course, it, it did happen, but when they the, the hormones will change because mm -hmm. there's not enough to sustain a pregnancy in the winter. That's so funny. if you're signaling to the system all the yeah, time yeah. that you're in a famine, there's no carbohydrates around, so it's not summertime, it's wintertime, and you're you're eating in this caloric deficit. Yeah. Your body's going to say lower estrogen, lower your progesterone because we cannot get pregnant and quit cycling. And that's what happens. Mm. And not to everybody, don't get me yeah. wrong. Yeah. But to a lot of people this can happen. And whether or not you lose your period, you still could be really messing with your hormones because mm -hmm. it is bound to happen as like a it's just this natural mechanism inside our body that goes mm, this isn't great long term we're, we're we've been eating 800 calories a day for six months now we're, we've got to down regulate some things yeah. and this is stressing us out the cortisol goes up cortisol now messes with your thyroid function 
the adrenal system, the progesterone starts to get sapped because cortisol needs progesterone. So that has a flow on effect to all the other hormones once your cortisol it's is just stressed. It's like rainfall effect, right? It just goes downstream. It goes. Wow. And so different people will be affected in different ways. But I've tested my thyroid during a ketogenic diet and it tanked. I was, I'm very sensitive with my thyroid and my reverse T3, which is a storage hormone went up and my mm. free T3 went down, which mm. tells me my metabolism slowed mm. almost mm. instantly doing keto. Wow. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, you're doom scrolling on Facebook and Twitter, getting triggered by all the different, uh, you know, issues going on in the world and getting more and more stressed in this highly artificial bizarre environment that we've created for us yes yes and then i mean you can you, i could keep going i mean we're waiting way too long to have children mm. you know we're meant to have kids at a young age like things like this for mm. there's so many things coming at us in our environment mm. that aren't right our circadian yeah. rhythm is off which yeah. then messes with all the other hormones so we are we're in an epidemic of hormonal dysfunction there's very mm. it's very rare that i see someone's hormonal prof profile and it's good yeah. i mean given people are coming to me because they think they, have <laughs> they, they usually you, do you've, you've probably got a special audience and not a great yes. diverse yes. population sample because you're the hormone <laughs> specialist but um so one thing in the data driven fasting challenges we see and we actually teach is that your blood sugar is going to be different different times of the month and leading up to um, menses that you have uh, potentially more elevated glucose different cravings and just unpack that why does that happen what is why is glucose higher in that time what should you eat what should you allow yourself to eat how much should you give in to your cravings at that point and and when is a better time to fast potentially? I think that's a fascinating area that a lot of people find yeah. really interesting. Instead of challenging with the data-driven fasting approach, so it's good to understand it and give yourself a bit of grace to, to transition through that period. Yeah, and I'll also relate it not just to the cycle but to menopausal women as well because mm -hmm. so when you have a 28-day cycle as a woman on average, right, the first half of your cycle, so from days one to 14, you're actually only really producing estrogen and some testosterone. Mm -hmm. There is not a lot of, there's almost no progesterone in that first half of the cycle. Yep. So estrogen is a growth hormone. It comes in, it helps to grow the uterine lining to hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, so you can get pregnant. Estrogen in and of itself, it has such a bad rap right now. People, everybody thinks they're estrogen dominant, which they are with the xenoestrogens, the fake estrogens, but actual yep. estrogen on the inside, we're not in this crazy estrogen dominant state. Mm. So estrogen's a beautiful hormone, everyone. Beautiful, you want your estrogen. People are just downing supplements to get rid of estrogen right now. Men and women, and men mm. need the estrogen too. It's very mm. important. So that first half of the cycle, you have lots and lots and lots of estrogen so from the time you get your period and you know you the first couple of days your hormones are at their lowest point and you don't feel great you did not doing nothing you know that's three to four days and then everyone will tell you it just starts like the mood everything just starts to climb yeah. up and you feel more social you want to you want to usually go out and get laid because your testosterone comes up testosterone <laughs> drives you to go out there and get sex this is, you know, I know this is not everybody, but to, this is what should be happening in a 28 day mm, cycle. In a healthy cycle. <laughs> in a healthy cycle. Me, but, uh, you know. Yes. And then that estrogen will actually peak on day 12 of the cycle. And that peak makes it so that you grow what's called progesterone receptors because progesterone and estrogen, they really need each other. But that first half of your cycle, you feel more confident. You want to go out there and get it because you're about to ovulate. So your body's driving you to go and get the sex. Mm. You want to date. You want to have your partner there. You want to chit chat. You feel good. And mm. if you really think about it, ladies, this is the time where cravings are at their lowest, yeah. typically. Yep. Right. So even if you have cravings all through the month, really focus. 
in that first half, you're going to find that your cravings are a lot less in the first mm. half of the month than they are in the second half. And there's reason to this. Mm. You're more estrogen makes you more insulin sensitive, mm. right? So you're not in this insulin resistant stage. Estrogen helps with that. So when you go into menopause and you start to, and you lose that estrogen, it's one of the reasons you put the weight on because you become mm. insulin resistant. Mm because of the lack of estrogen. And most women don't know this. They think that estrogen's all bad. And I'm like, no, this is amazing. It's gonna help you to lose weight. Too much is not a good thing, but too mm. little is just as bad. So mm. you don't wanna drain it because it helps you to be insulin sensitive. This is a great time, I feel, to do fasting because it's easier on my system. The first half of the cycle. Yes, first half of the cycle, you don't, the cravings aren't as bad, you feel good, you you mm. want to exercise, right? So that's the time of the month where you do maybe a little bit more hit, more challenging workouts, you do some fasting, you can stick with the diet. It's a great time to start data-driven fasting is at the first half of your cycle. Yep. Second half of your cycle, now progesterone comes in. And progesterone is this very calming hormone it also raises your metabolism. So that's good because you are a little bit calmer and you're not feeling as social. You start to become more introverted. You don't want sex as much because now you've ovulated. It's like, no, you've had it. You're fun, mister. Get out of here. Moments over. <laughs> Moments Windows over. Passed. Hit the road. My husband always tells <laughs> me, Mark, you know. Yeah, my husband's always like, oh my God, I'm, I'm so grateful that you taught me this about how a woman's cycle goes. I'm like, look, you've got two week window here. Well, you can come get it as much as you want. The second half of the cycle, you're going to have to work for it way harder. <laughs> and he's, he he just loves that I told him that because he oh. now understands how to how, how to approach me. All the guys are loving times. this podcast right yes, now. Yes, yes. Well so good to know. So second half of the cycle, progesterone comes in. It's more calming. It's more anti-anxiety. So mm -hmm. women that are going through perimenopause, they'll find that they get a lot more anxiety than they used to. That's because your progesterone is going. That can mm. also cause insomnia as well. Mm. So women will tend to, if they're deficient in that progesterone on the second half of the cycle, find that they'll get worse PMS, the more agitated, more anxiety, and more insomnia. And that can be a sign that you don't have enough progesterone happening. Right. And progesterone is always the first to go in most cases as you age. And when you get to about 35, you start to lose your progesterone and starts to decline. So these things will start to mm. creep up. Now, the second half of the cycle, because estrogen is a little bit lower, estrogen is also really important for the production of serotonin, which is like the feel good neurotransmitter hormone that we all want. And so without the estrogen, we can get a little bit depressed. Mm. So estrogen has to do more with depression. Progesterone has more to do with anxiety. Mm. So we're losing our estrogen in the second half of the cycle. We want the serotonin. Mm. So we start to feel a little bit blue. Your body goes, I need some more serotonin. Guess how else you can make serotonin? Give me the Carbohydrates. So the Give second half of this, exactly. And, but your metabolism is a little bit higher thanks to that progesterone. So you can actually tolerate a little bit more carbohydrates. Okay. Now, some fitness people will say like, um, I think it's Jade Tita. He'll say um, that to, to try and lose weight in the second half of the cycle, because that's when your metabolism is higher. But as a woman, I think mm, <laughs> that Jade, is a really hard, yeah, about. exactly. <laughs> I'm like, uh, that's when I can't control my cravings. And so yeah. I save that for my second half of my cycle, you know, like the first mm. half of my cycle, I'm, I can eat cleanly really, really easily. Second half of my cycle, I want to say, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to eat some of that dark chocolate, maybe have yeah. a little bit of ice cream and I'm not, I'm going to relax a little bit and actually increase my carbohydrates because I feel better and it helps with my serotonin production. And be a bit more forgiving about your cravings and yes. understand that it's part of that. Um, yeah. So so why are the blood sugar is elevated in that second half more than the first half? What's the difference? Because you the lose your estrogen. There? Right? The so second half of your, your estrogen goes down, your insulin resistance goes up. So your blood sugar can actually go up. Yeah. So in the data-driven fasting app, I've got a little tag that says, you know, 
it's that time of the month and you get a little higher trigger so you can be a bit more forgiving and you're not chasing this ridiculously low trigger that, you know, after the period starts, you can then go again and chase a, a trigger harder again, like you said, and go into that first couple of weeks. Yeah. So fascinated by the the carb cycling and, and blood sugar a little bit. I'd love you to talk about that a little bit more, but um, why is it good to maintain healthy blood sugars? Why is that good for hormonal regulation? And, and then how does carb cycling factor into that? I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that everybody should jump out and um, binge on refined carbs, but when are some carbs useful and, and when should you avoid them potentially? Yeah, and... You know, as you go, as as a woman's going through peri and menopause, which ladies is from the time you're 35 till the time you're probably 55. Like it's a long mm-hmm. time. People don't realize that that their hormones really start to change in their late mm-hmm. 30s, and then come 40s, it really shifts. So without those hormones, and you you're, you become more insulin resistant and all the research shows this, that they, you know, menopausal women have a much higher chance of developing type two diabetes, leptin Mm. resistance, Mm. insulin resistance. And this is because your, your metabolism is going down because of your progesterone going down. Mm. You start pouring cortisol, which messes with your blood sugar. Then that drains the progesterone even more and creates a blood sugar problem. Like Mm. it's just this horrible, perfect storm of things Mm. happening and then the weight just starts packing on. And then women are like, but my cravings are through the roof. I can't stop eating because their hormones are such a mess. And so you have this underlying drive to just eat and eat and eat and you can never get full. And so, but yet you have to, everyone's telling you, keep your blood sugar stable, you do, go low carb, do this. And it's like, you have to find this happy medium of mm-hmm. how can I stabilize my blood sugar and do data-driven fasting and have my hormones support that Mm. because you really want that. Now Mm. on the flip side of that, Marty diet has to come first. Mm. So a lot of women, you know, they could do data driven fasting or a carb cycling, like I have a paleo diet, whatever it is, and have that be the foundation to what changes their hormones. Some women, that's all they need to do because once they get that insulin in check and then the cortisol is not going crazy all the time and all this other stuff. And then the more fat you put on because you're more, because you're insulin resistant, then the more estrone you're going to make, which is the fat producing estrogen. And it's once again, a perfect storm. So you have all these factors, but so dieting and losing weight can be enough to balance a person's hormones, depending Mm. on what the hormone imbalance is. For instance, if someone has high testosterone and they've, then that makes them pour out insulin and Mm. then they become insulin resistant. And Mm. so those two go hand in hand, that's polycystic ovarian syndrome. So somebody like that could do a ketogenic diet, a carnivore diet, whatever, low carb diet and that could be the perfect diet for them mm. to lose the weight and shift that hormonal imbalance does that make sense yeah it's all mm. fascinating stuff and uh i love how you've gone down the rabbit hole through study and experience to to delve into it um so in terms of um you know when your blood sugars start to drop you can after exercise potentially you can drop in some you know less refined carbohydrates to bring it back up and you'll feel good and get the serotonin and be able to sleep better and get that um, you know, dopamine response and serotonin response from the extra carbohydrates at that point. But then if, you're, if your blood sugars are elevated most of the time, you don't want to be loading in a whole lot of extra carbs. So that's whether I think looking at blood sugars is is really helpful and in the data-driven fasting app, we've sort of got a, a trigger that says, you know, your blood sugars are really low. You you must have worked out and drained all your glucose and you actually need to bring it back up a little bit and that helps people not to binge at that point because they're really hungry and they're not binging on crap carb plus fat food together and it just helps them get back to normalcy and get that nice healthy blood sugar range but um yeah. so in terms of what to eat uh, to optimize hormonal balance uh, you know 
protein and, and what sort of nutrients you're looking for and then what foods to, you tend to find most helpful for that? Well, I'm, I'm in the camp that you're in, really. <laughs> I don't, um, I, of course, mine's in a different way, but we were just talking on my podcast that I think the way that it has to go is that we have to start doing weight loss in cycles because, mm-hmm. you know, we got to take a month to lose some weight, but then we've got to come out of it and not lose any weight for a mm-hmm. month or a couple of weeks or whatever it is, right? However Practice much you have to lose and a change it. way of eating yes. un- until you're yeah. ready to go again. Because the more you diet, and it doesn't matter what diet you're, you're choosing, if you're in this caloric deficit all the time, Mm. your body's metabolism is going to adjust to that. Mm. Not only that, our bodies are just, we, it likes homeostasis. So it's mm. going to, it's like um, working out how they say you got to change up what you're doing because your body adjusts to it. It's same with eating. Your body will adjust to how you're eating. It's going to, mm. so you can be eating the best diet in the world for you, mm. but your body will adapt to that and stop losing weight. It's mm. just, it's the way our, our bodies work, especially mm. the female hormonal system. Mm. So you're better to kind of cycle it. So what I came up with after years of experience, like 15 years of this now, I went through the keto f- craze. I went to mm. carnivore. I, I did the paleo. I still do paleo. Um, but I basically said, okay, I, I have all these people coming to me with all of these problems from going keto and carnivore and you know but yet it works really well for a while so how what's wrong here now unlike you i don't do the data stuff like as well as you do i just went from my clinical experience with women and said okay i gotta look at this from a hormonal standpoint what needs to happen so either a woman can do it cyclically so that exactly what we just talked about, where the first half of the cycle, she puts more effort into the weight loss phase. And then the second half is more about maintaining and, mm-hmm. and allowing for some of more of those good carbohydrates in the form of sweet potato, potato, carrots, whatever, fruit, that kind of thing, where you up those and mm-hmm. you listen to those cravings. Not go out and eat a bag of cookies, but you know, you can have your little treats or whatever, but mm. you still stay within that kind of paleo sphere. Mm. Mm. Or you do it in a way of like how you do it, where it's like you you maintain for a month and then I'll throw in, for instance, like a weight loss week mm. every five weeks or so, where I'll drop the calories, drop the carbs, boom, let's do it. Or I'll do it throughout the week where they'll have, you know, three days a week of intermittent fasting. I do use bulletproof coffee, but I don't overdo the fat in my diet plans. I do that because it's easier on the adrenals. And most women have very sensitive adrenals that I work with. So Mm. having a little bit of MCT in there or heavy Mm. cream can really help blunt that response from the body. And so it's easier for women. And plus it can help them to fast a little bit longer. Mm. And so I vary the times of fasting. I tell my ladies, like, you know, see how it feels. Now I'm going to tell them, do data-driven fasting. <laughs> <laughs> like, Thank you. you know, like, to see how they feel. And if they okay. find that if they fast till 2 o'clock that they're then gorging on fast food, that's too long. You've got to dial it back. Yeah. 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 And so I'll do that. And then I'll throw in, like, some high, higher carb days where I'll bring up the carbs to, let's say, 70 to 100 and so that they'll have two days of that. And then it'll, some days they'll have a really low calorie day. Some days they'll have a maintenance day. So it's constantly shifting. Mm-hmm. So your body can't adjust. But by the time the week is over, you have been in a caloric deficit. Mm-hmm. Or, or even like, a, I know the, the bodybuilding scene and uh, like the, the carb cycling around the workouts. So most of the time you'll be low carb. And then when you've had a heavy workout and done legs and something really heavy you're gonna dump in some carbohydrate to refill the glycogen because that your blood sugar is going to tank at that point and you don't want to be pounding in excess carbohydrates when you don't need it but there's sometimes where you do need it because it's a very glycolytic undertaking that you need to recover from yeah and i Um, tell people too just you know, it depends too on what your hormones are doing. Everybody has to look at their hormonal profile and say, okay, based on that, how should I be eating? So if somebody does truly have estrogen dominance or they've got PCOS, mm. 
a lower carb diet is going to be it. A lower inflammatory diet is mm. going to be it. If somebody's got adrenal fatigue and they've okay. got hypothyroidism, they shouldn't fast hardly at all. And if they do do it, they have to do it with the bulletproof coffee. Only do it maybe two mm. to three days a week and short, and maybe till you know eleven o'clock or something mm. like mm. a short fast. Mm. And 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 really pay attention. How does that make you feel? Are you super tired afterwards? Mm. Are you wanting to eat everything? Because then it's you're not in a place with your hormones, adrenals, mm. and thyroid mm. to do that. You can go any further. But yeah, yeah I, I love you've really got the hard one research understanding from lots of uh, personal experience that you've been through it and coached other people through it so yes. are there any particular nutrients specifically rather than foods that you try to emphasize to promote good hormonal function i i emphasis of course like once again, like you say, like the, the mm. micronutrients are very important to your hormones, uh, mm. cholesterol, good cholesterol mm. is needed to make hormones. So you don't want to go completely no fat. Maybe if you're in a weight loss phase, you drop back on the fat a lot, but in general, you should have it in moderate levels. Like I think mm. that the no fat, low fat craze that I grew up in, I think that really messed with women's hormones. Yeah. Wow. Because we didn't have the building blocks to make hormones. Mm. And that's, you have to be really careful. You have to be very careful about making sure that you do get some good fat in there. And that, yeah. you, and, and the protein, of course, too, right? The muscle building is going to be key to the hormonal system. And most I mean, times, the, the fat comes along with the protein and they're all packaged together nicely. Yes. Um, to, to leverage off the protein, I think you were talking to Robin Heimer and Simpson. And when I was talking to them, yes. they were, mentioning just very briefly a study that they've done with menopausal women and the pro the, the, the importance of prioritizing protein in that time to help them have a smoother transition do you want to unpack that i'm, I'm fascinated to learn and other people might be too well unfortunately though he didn't really specify much about it to be honest he said i'm writing a paper and so i asked him about it in the interview and it does go against what their general consensus was by the end of the book, which was during your, I think it was your forties and fifties, you are not to eat a lot of protein that that's when you dial back on the protein. But now they're saying, except that doesn't apply to menopausal <laughs> women. And I'm like, so uh, why are we just eating protein then all the way through? And I, I think so, because every woman's going to go through that time. Right. Yeah. So maybe if you're a woman that reaches menopause at a later stage in the game that maybe you could then go without protein as much protein in your 40s hmm. but like for me i started going into menopause at 42 43 so i'm now upping my protein because since hmm. reading their book and following you i'm like you know what i think it is time to bring i was already yeah. eating a sufficient amount but yeah. i started to weight lift more so i started to put more protein in and it does really help with the weight loss yeah. and the hormonal system. It does. Yeah, what they said to me is that going through menopause, you become more insulin resistant. If you're getting preserved muscle, plenty of protein, it really helps with the insulin resistance. So therefore, all the other hormonal cascade is much more dialed in and gentle. So you're, much, you're more likely to have a a smoother transition if you're carrying more muscle less fat and and to do that you need resistance training and uh you know plenty of protein to support that that muscle so it just seems to be the same at nearly any yeah. age you need adequate protein without excess energy and, and or you overeat and, or you overeat you just keep eating and so you get the nutrients you need particularly protein but but all of the nutrients so yeah it's uh i just feel like a broken record eventually with that but um yeah <laughs> so uh so in terms of, of going beyond just diet and symptoms when do you advise someone start looking at testing and testing hormones because that can be a, a massively deep rabbit hole and as i mentioned to you in um, facebook chat recently my dad has been in a very deep rabbit hole you can imagine me but even more obsessive and uh more you know, research driven and down the rabbit hole looking at um, hormones to manage his prostate health. He's now 77 and, and watered it all off pretty well. But I know it's a, a very complex area and needs um, some really thoughtful 
guidance and, and testing? You know, at what point do people make that jump? If what do they need to try first, and and how do they take that journey to look at whether they need to some exogenous help with the hormones? Yeah. And, you know, I think diet always has to come first. Like I said, it's the foundation. And then if you're still struggling after that and you still, you're not losing the weight, you've got, you know, PMS problems, you've got heavy bleeding, whatever it might be, mm. then you can start to say, okay, I think it's time then to check my hormones. And like I said, I had to do it when I was 33. Now, so every person is going to kind of be different, but we are starting to see hormonal dysfunction at an earlier and earlier age mm. in women. So if typically though, from 38 on, you want to start testing hormones. You want to start testing then because you want a baseline of what your hormones, sh where, where you feel ha okay, relatively okay. Or you can be like, okay, things I think aren't quite the same as they used to be. So let's test my hormones and see where they're at and know then that they may need it to come up a little bit farther in order to feel your best and like you did when you were in your 20s. Mm. So at that point, you want to test what's called your available hormone levels because blood work through serum. So that's blood is serum. When you go to your doctor, they will test your hormones through blood work. Mm -hmm. Blood will only test what's called bound hormone levels. Yep. So bound, they're bound to a protein. It's like this little shuttle bus that shuttles the, pro the hormones all over your body, drops them off at a receptor site. If they're riding that bus, your body's not able to use it. It's got to come mm. off the bus. Now it's an available hormone. And that's what your body's going to utilize within the cell and do mm. its, it's going to do its functions. Mm. So if you just test through serum, you're only going to test what's on the bus. So your yep. body really doesn't know well, how much available hormones though do I have? Yep. So it's not very often reflected in bound hormones, how much hormones you really have so mm. when you're in your fertile years and you're still cycling it is far more accurate to test through saliva or wow. urine hormone testing these will neither of them you can get through an md unfortunately so you are paying out of pocket but they can mm. be done from home mm. i mean i ship my kits anywhere in the world mm. so it is ideal to do it that way if you can't you can't afford it it's still worth going and getting it done through your doctor and really just going on your symptoms. Once you see those labs, combine that with the symptoms and mm -hmm. to say, okay, you know, the estrogen looks okay. It's on the lower side or the progesterone's on the lower side, but she's getting heavy bleeding. She's got really bad PMS and she's got insomnia. I think she needs some progesterone. Mm -hmm. and, and then as you get older, you can then rely more on the serum if you so choose. It's yeah. still more accurate to go saliva and urine, but if you don't have a period and you're not cycling or you're starting to miss periods, then it can be, that will usually be reflected in serum levels at that time because it's yeah. they're all low, bound and unbound hormones. Yeah. They're all low. They're all out of whack. They're yeah. all out of whack, yes. Mm. And so at that point you can, you can test that way through and but cortisol you can't cortisol you always got to go saliva wow yeah the, the 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 female hormonal cycle is is completely fascinating a deep rabbit hole and overwhelming for me to to contemplate so what do you how do you guide people to do the right thing and and have enough support without pushing it too hard and i know with um if you know, jamming in excess exogenous testosterone for men can then convert to estrogen and actually have a you know a reverse effect that you don't want and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And that's why people are all on dim to reduce their estrogen after they've jammed in too much testosterone and they get, you know, men on the steroids and, and testosterone have got the big bellies and they don't look good at all. They're just mass monsters. So yeah, I mean, you, you don't want to get to that point. How do you monitor that? Uh, the hormonal profile to make sure you're not adding too much of the wrong thing over time? And, and how do you, in your role, work with someone to work with their doctor? That's a, a fascinating little story there to help people make that jump. Okay, that's a lot to unpack. Okay. <laughs> so, so men-wise, let's just talk about testosterone for a second. As men age, a lot of men will start to lose their testosterone. So then you start get seeing the man. But how old are you? Uh, 45. 
Okay, not same as me. And your wife's 45? Uh, yeah, 44. 44. Okay, so you guys are both transitioning as well. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the thick of it. 45 is, yeah. Oh, shit, this is my personal control. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have to I have to manage my sleep and stress and you do. activity you levels. Do. And, yes. and, yeah, which I don't do well, but I'm trying to manage my life as best as I can. Yes. So as a man gets older, you can lose your testosterone. Some don't. Mm. And same with women. About 50% of women will lose their testosterone as they go into menopause. But the other 50% keep their healthy levels of it. So Do you mean lose completely or they just um, drop just by drop. half? Or? Yeah. Oh, it's just always different. Some people are – I saw somebody's yesterday. She was bottom of the barrel. Hardly any detectable testosterone in her body. But yet off the charts DHEA. So everybody's mm. very different. But for men, if you go on – testosterone replacement what tends to happen is they give you this high dose of testosterone you feel like a million bucks right mm. you're just on top of the world you're at the gym you want to have sex all the time you're like woo and then about a month in it all just dies out and you go to your back to your doctor and you're like i felt so great now it's all my symptoms are Me coming more. back what's happening and it's because it's such a huge amount and they usually shoot you it like a, mm. a shot. So that mm. you'll go in and for a shot once a week or every two weeks, I'm not sure what it is. And they give you this massive dose. And what happens is the receptors, so the receptors are like these little satellite dishes to grab onto that testosterone and pull it into the cell. They get down-regulated because there's so much testosterone that they're like, oh, I'm going to stop working. And they start to go down. And then you've got all this free floating testosterone that's then going to get start getting converted to estrogen and it's, it's a mess. And so what you can do there is the best thing to do is to cycle it. Mm. So just like women cycle hormones, men can cycle hormones too. And mm. they, if, as your wife goes into menopause and you start to lose, if you do start to lose your testosterone, you can find doctors that will prescribe it so that, they will cycle your hormones together yeah. so that, oh, wow. you know, you, you, and for a man, either way, even if you don't have a wife, you still want to cycle it, which just means at certain times of the month, you're going to have a lower dose and then you're going to go higher for a week and then you're going to come and back and down. Tying back to the previous conversation, if you cycle it at, you know, the first half of the, yeah, okay. Yeah. Hot so that tip. way your <laughs> can match each other, right? So a woman, if she's on testosterone and estrogen usually too is really drives the sex drive as well. Mm -hmm. You can cycle these to match each other so that you're both wanting to have sex at the same time. And then you don't run into the problem of downregulating your receptors and you're, mm -hmm. cause you're going up and down with the testosterone rather than a huge slam all at once, mm -hmm. which downregulates the receptors. So, so wow. that's the answer to that. Now, when Never it comes to, that. yeah, it's so cool. Hey, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I told my husband one day, if you lose your testosterone, <laughs> this is what's happening. <laughs> I've got this plan You're going to take control of this situation once and for all. <laughs> if you can't do it, I'm taking over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for women, I always say like in general, as you're going through your late 30s to your early 40s, there's things that you can do to, to optimize your hormone levels without taking hormones. So you could, there's amazing supplements out there. You know, you, if you are estrogen dominant, you can take the DIM and the calcium deglucurate. If you've got no progesterone, you can take Vitex, you can take MACA for testosterone and estrogen. So there's all these amazingly powerful hormones that really can boost your own levels. And so it's like, it's forcing your ovaries to just have kind of one more one last kick of the can mm. let's push out some more progesterone before all things you know deplete and go mm. out the door and then that starts to happen so this is different for each woman like i said it might happened early at 42 mm. that was i think for several different reasons um, most women typically it's not till their late 40s that they start to to really miss their hormones where the supplements no longer are working. They're a hot mess. They've got hot flashes. They're 10 pounds overweight. They're, mm -hmm. you know, they're ang angry, anxiety, depressed. Like it's, it can be 
terrible. There's many women that say that they become suicidal because they are mm. such a disaster without their hormones. Mm. And I'll tell you, do not wait till then to do something about it. The minute you start to feel things going, you know, start the supplements. If that's not enough, then you go find a doctor or myself or somebody that can help you to address it with bioidentical hormones. Now, this is because once your ovaries stop producing hormones, there is no amount of supplements that is going to bring life back to those ovaries. Yep. We all wish there was, there is not. So at that point in time, all the research shows, Marty, that if you replace your hormones, you will have a reduction of all cause mortality by 30% on just one year of replacing hormones. So you are safer and going, you are going to be healthier if you replace with bioidentical hormones over if you don't. So a lot of women have it in their head that they're dangerous, they're going to cause breast cancer, all these horrible things. Same with men and their testosterone. They really worry about that. But your hormones are your vitality. And let's go back to, we are here to procreate. So when we no longer can procreate, your body is going to kill you off. And how does it do that? You're gonna drop, it's gonna drop the hormones. The world doesn't need you anymore. You're no good to the tribe. You can't procreate. And this, we only used to live until the very start of menopause, if that, mm. right? Average woman's lifespan was that we would you know, die at 40. So we're now extended life till we're eighties, nineties, right? So without our hormones, we literally start to die. Mm. There was a new, there's a new research that just came out of Arizona. They did this very large study on estrogen, bioidentical estrogen replacement. And it showed that if women replace their estrogen for six years or more in menopause, they had a 78% reduction of getting dementia or Alzheimer's. Wow. That is massive. Considering there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease or dementia, and estrogen is so important for the brain. So is testosterone. Testosterone is mm. important for your breast tissue, even. Mm for a woman, mm. for your mm. bone health, your muscle retention. You need these things. You need progesterone in order to counteract that estrogen. Even if you don't have a uterus or you're not bleeding anymore, mm. you still need progesterone to be protective of the breast tissue. Yeah. I can just go on and on, but I'll stop there. <laughs> <I'll wait. laughs> on, on that, as a segue, is was there anything for women who have had a hysterectomy? Kerry had a question about hysterectomies and, and how that, you know, you're not postmenopausal, but, you know, what do you do to manage hormones at that yeah. point? So there's two types of hysterectomies. One where they take just the uterus, they leave the ovaries and they tell you you're all going to be fine because we've just left the ovaries. So you're still going to be cycling. But what happens without the uterus, the ovaries start to atrophy faster. So you, you do tend to see women, even though they still have their ovaries, once they have that hysterectomy, they will start to go into menopause sooner. Goes downhill earlier. Mm -hmm. If mm. they take the ovaries, you are like within 24 hours in going into menopause. Wow. And at that point, you really do want to, you just want to start replacing those hormones immediately because you will feel horrible. Most women feel absolutely horrible. I've had women tell me like, I was going to kill myself. Mm. I thought I was losing my mind. Like check me into the crazy home. I'm done. And it was because they lost their hormones so quickly. So yes, replacing then and what, you know, if you've got your ovaries, test your levels, test a few times throughout the month. If you don't know where you're at, you know, test once a week, if you have to for a month to see where your hormones are at, check your follicular stimulating hormone. Cause that's a, if that's elevated above 10, then we know that you're starting to go into menopause and then that would be a good time to start replacing. You don't want to wait till you're a hot mess, 30 pounds overweight, you know, no libido, dried out That's vagina. Like, point. Oh, like you just, most doctors wait till then, or they'll tell you, oh, your hormones are fine because your hormones are at the levels that they should be for your age. Yeah. So they say, oh, you're fine. And you're not fine. necessarily want to be average, do you? No, no, no. And you want to, you just want to get on it 
sooner than later, because the longer you wait, and that's probably a question that people will have is, well, how late can you start hormones? Mm -hmm. Because some women, mm -hmm. they're 10 years post-menopause and they're still hot flashing and they're still overweight and they can't lose weight. The receptors do go to, it's like they go to sleep, they downregulate. So the, you, you can go on hormones at that point, but you have to do it in a very system, like systemized manner. So you start very, 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 very low dose and wait till those receptors wake up and the body starts mm. to take in that hormone. Cool. So you've got a, a hormone quiz. Can you tell I us? I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I've heard you talk about it. And uh, what does that cover that sort of helps you understand if you may need to investigate this further based mm -hmm. on your symptoms? Yeah. So if people are listening going, oh, I think this is me. <laughs> I think I have hormone dysfunction. 80% <laughs> like of the people listening probably are. Yeah. Someone's raising their hand going, me, me. <laughs> so I have this awesome quiz. It's actually very comprehensive. So it takes, you know, it takes probably five minutes to go through it. But it goes through the five most common hormone deficiencies that I see. And so it's just a really great way to, to start. It's not written in stone because we don't know until you actually test but it's this awesome starting point to say hey this might be a hormone that's causing you problems right now and you want to you may you may now want to investigate it further mm -hmm. so you take the quiz and then i'll give you an ebook about that specific um, hormone deficiency and you can read about what you can do what kind of diet is best for that hormonal deficiency oh. i always stick within the ancestral nutrition because mm -hmm. i see that that best as much as I, I'm always one for everybody finding their own weight loss code, their own diet, you know, doing some data stuff to figure out what is going to mm. work for you. I really believe in that. Mm. But in general, I have just seen that an ancestral based diet mm. works best long term. Mm. So my diets will, I'll tell you which one to do, whether that's autoimmune, whether it's paleo, mm. carnivore, keto, that kind of thing. Mm. I better put data driven fasting in there. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll also give you just some tips on supplements and other things that you can do to get started. And I give you a two week um, carb cycling meal plan that goes, you know, takes you from keto to paleo throughout the week, mm. doing different cycles of carbs and different cycles of fasting. Yeah, cool. Sounds like a really cool, valuable resource. So you're yeah. vibrantly shining and thriving at 45. What do you do to manage your hormonal status after what mm -hmm. you've learned over the last what 17 years or whatever, trying to dig into this to make it work for you? What do you do yeah. on a daily basis in terms of your routine and you know, what you enjoy eating? And Yeah. yeah. Um, well, like I said, I'm very paleo-based. I cycle when I'm trying to lose weight or when I'm trying to, I'm actually, I haven't tried to lose weight for a very long time, but I'm just in maintenance. Um, mm. Not to say I could probably lose some because I gained some when I started going into perimenopause, but I decided I was going to try to embrace a little bit of weight gain instead, <laughs> because it is very normal for a woman to soften a little bit. Mm. And women have such a hard time embracing that. So I'm trying to lead by example and say, Hey, <laughs> A few pounds is okay. You know, 20 yeah. pounds is not, but mm. you know, 10 pounds, five, 10 pounds, that's okay. And mm. your body does this as a natural defense because your body can make estrogen from fat cells and mm. estrogen is so important to the body that mm. it just, it's a natural thing. We are supposed to soften a little bit. So what I did was I was going into menopause at 42. And so I started to, you know, my period was getting later and later. I was hot flashing like crazy, gaining weight. So I was like, okay, I'm going to come, I'm going to put this to a stop right now because I'm not going into menopause at 42. <laughs> and I did, and I reversed it. And so for three years now, I've been having a 28 day cycle. I've got no more hot flashes. It's been awesome. And that's because I've replaced the hormones. So I test my hormones yearly. i monitor what the doses are for my bioidentical hormones. Right now I take estradiol, estriol, and progesterone. And that really helps. And I know Our how to dial it in and dial it off. Yeah, I do an estrogen patch with a little bit of cream to top it off at certain times of the month. And then I do a progesterone cream in the second half of the month. So I still mimic what my cycle does. Mm. It's great. And then I take like a menopause supplement that has just some black cohosh and Vitex. And I find that that helps further with the hot flashes and diet. Like I said, I just, I, I cycle throughout the months where 
I don't tend to fast in the second half of my cycle very much. I do more fasting in the first half of my cycle. I just listen. I'm very good at tuning into what my body needs now. Mm -hmm. Such uh, cool information. I love it. I'm really learning a ton legitimately here. So, um, especially about women's hormones. So, uh, so what are you excited about for the future? What's, what's coming up for Karen Martell? You've got so much momentum and enthusiasm I and vibrance do. for it all. It's just a passion for this. So I love that. I do. And I think that that's where I see it. Like, it shocks me, Marty, how many women have no idea about any of this. Mm-hmm. They don't know that their hormones can start changing at 35. They don't know that bioidentical hormones are safer to use than not to use. Mm. The education is lacking out there so much. Like I didn't think that I, me, could do this. Like I was a nutritionist. Mm. Now I'm a hormone specialist too. But I still thought, like, without being a doctor, why would why would women come to me? And it's amazing how much I can help women because they mm. are not getting this information from their doctors. They're not getting it from anywhere. Mm. It's just not being talked about enough. Mm. And it's this massive piece to the puzzle, to the weight loss puzzle and to your mood and your life. And it has to do with everything, your relationships. It's so important. So I just, my goal is to hit the masses more. I want more. I want to educate as many women as I can get my hands on. You're just extremely passionate about it. So there was a question in the chat about where can they find the quiz, which is a, karenmartel.com you just go to the yep. homepage there and check it out and uh, yep. i think i'm gonna get the wife to take the quiz after this and uh <laughs> i don't know cycling idea sounds like a bit of fun but yeah. uh yeah <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> might talk about that later anyway no yes. but um, th- thank you so much it's been great to get to chat yes. to you for the last and I'll make hour sure that I can and come on be and... yours before then and yeah i'll come yeah. on and answer any questions for people that watch this yeah. later you can take me i'm in the group so if you've got questions about anything that we've discussed, I can answer your questions or I can point you in the direction of my own podcast where I've probably yeah. answered the question at some point. Which is really, really, really good. I've been enjoying that. And like I said, you've just got a lot of experience through diving into the information and data, but also apply it in your own life and seeing it with real life people and helping them get yeah. success. So yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. uh, Chatting again and uh, keeping contact. Thanks, Karen. Bye. Bye.